data from throughout all of the Salish and territories. Um, so what I'm, what I'm interested in is, um, as, as all archaeologists are interested in, is uh, site formation processes. And, um, you know, archaeological sites just don't appear out of nowhere. Um, so how, uh, how does an archaeological site occur? Well, to me, the site formation process is two aspects. It's got a material site formation um, aspect and a non-material site formation aspect. The material site formation aspect um, refers to uh, deals with the geology because there's aspects of uh, these sites that are absolutely uh, unique. For example, uh, of the geology I'm saying, for example, 80% uh, of the rock art sites found across Canada from the Canadian Shield to the coast of British Columbia are granite formations. So granite and, 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 and everything associated with granite, the, the, the special features of that rock, that geology, are really an important part of the site formation process, the material and the non-material, as we'll see. Um, so material culture includes the site, it also or, or the, the geological formation, it also includes the material culture that's found at the site. For example, the, um, the, the, the paintings or the, uh, the carvings that appear in the rock surface, and they also consist of, sub, of surface and subsurface deposits. A lot of people don't pay attention to that. You know, a lot of rock art studies, I mean, rock art is found uh, throughout the world, and um, people tend to kind of lump it all together, but you know, the, this rock art produced all over the world was recorded, was uh, produced at different times, uh, in different places, different historical trajectories. So whenever we look at rock art in a specific area, we've got to focus on the local specific um, culture and the history of, uh, of its production there. Um, so that, the material is, uh, you know, the stuff of archaeologists, uh, you know, the paintings, the surface and subsurface features of these sites, and a lot of people don't put those together either. So I'm very interested in how those interact, the, the archaeological deposits and the, uh, the paintings. Now the non-material site formation process is uh, the one that really kind of interests me because that's the prior knowledge of place and time. It is um, basically the indigenous theory, the indigenous anthropology, you will, which relies on systems of knowledge that are different than Western systems. Um, and uh, here we have a lot of, and, and the non-material includes things like stories, language, place names, um, songs, all this sort of stuff that uh, informs the material signatures that we find at these sites. Um, and we're, I'm really privileged to be able to work in this area because of the direct historical and cultural continuity between uh, the people, the descendant communities that are here today, and the, uh, the, archaeolo or the archaeological remains of the past. And so I, I really draw upon that um, and, and use it in my interpretation. Um, the cultural continuity and the practi of, of practices, particularly, um, tells us how things work. And uh, both so both these material site formation processes and the non-material site formation processes, both are equally important in uh, the study of rock art. So here we have a painting from uh, Slave Tooth Territory. Rock art is the material signature of a prior place and knowledge, or, or the prior knowledge of place and time, and the product of historically contingent um, and it, no, but the rock art itself is historically contingent and specific to time and place. So the place, um, this is a symposium on Coast Salish uh, territories, but um, as, as all of you are, I'm sure, aware, the, the Salish territories, the, 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 um, the, the geography covered by the Salish languages covers an extensive area that includes the interior and the coast. So in my work, I don't really like to separate these two places. And when you go back and study the history, you see the interaction between the coast and the interior all the time. To me, it's just uh, I, I tend not to separate you know, the coast from the interior. I know that they're distinctive cultures and areas and that. But um, I think fundamentally, the culture is, is very similar throughout this area. And I've studied rock art throughout this area and, um, and uh, drawn upon it in my interpretations. And uh, there's, there's a consistency of practice 
uh, throughout this entire area. So, um, what informs me is uh, this, this is a fundamental uh, indigenous um, concept, Tamah. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, there's different pronunciations. Uh, we call it Tamih in the Intercontinental area, in the Intercontinental. But it is the earth, it's the world, it's land, it's the world and everything in it. And um, it's um, also about, so in this world where everything is connected and related, um, the world consists of social relations where they're not limited to human beings. So they include all living things, all non-living things. So it's a vast uh, interconnected network of um, humans and non-humans and um, includes all creation. This uh, concept of tamak, um, reality in, in, in tamak um, is the sum total of existence and includes the spiritual, non-material world and the physical material world. Now archaeology has covered the physical world pretty good. You know, we have a lot of technical um, ability and expertise to um, record, measure, study the physical remnants of things. But we're not so good when it comes up to the spiritual aspect, which involves a lot of, uh, you know, time to learn about, you know, stories about place, uh, language is very useful. Um, you know, the, 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 the non-material stuff that is the, um, the physical stuff is the material signature of that stuff up there. So to understand the physical stuff, we have to have uh, some grounding in the spiritual non-material aspects. And that's kind of um, what I like to um, explore, how they uh, interact. And these are some of the ways. This is a Hokanitnam language here. Shukwem um, are the origin stories. Very important to know the stories of the landscapes where we um, study this, uh, this uh, rock art. Shnawayal um, are the uh, cultural teachings. I love that word. The Musqueam elder taught me that that word means to put the thought in the child's head. So these are teachings that began actually in the womb and continued all through one's life. And Snow Wild are the practices that, you know, really help us interpret the archaeological record. So you, the one brought them, is a more recent history, which is also very important because um, a lot of archaeologists uh, like to think of uh, British Columbia as having, or, or, or First Nations as having a deep past, but not a recent past. So I'm interested in both those things, the deep past and the recent past. So, um, Here's some uh, rock art, or as they say in the uh, Coast Salish language, Kalahal. Um, we call it Tsuk up in the interior. Um, and here are just some examples of uh, uh, different types of rock art. Uh, these are um, paintings, uh, red ochre paintings, tamos, very important uh, um, substance in Coast Salish, uh, interior Salish cultures, and used to make the uh, paintings. Uh, that's on Pit Lake, it marks the Transformer site. The Transformer uh, hails visited this place. Uh, up on the upper right, we have a, a so-called petroglyph, um, Suns, which is a transformed being uh, now located uh, on the seawall below the Lansing Bridge. And you can see the, um, these cupules that are carved up the side of it in this old photograph. And then this on the lower right is from Chakwila. And this shows, um, this is a, a site called Sahala Halls that has been destroyed in the 1970s. It's in the way of Highway 7, and uh, they took it out. Jack hammered out all the uh, carvings in there. And uh, but the name of that place is Sahala Halls. Now, Halala Halls um, means writing. So it's, um, I like to use these indigenous terms, because you know, we call these pictographs, pictograms, petroglyphs, petro that, petro this. I like to use the indigenous language because it, um, you know, it just ignores these kind of uh, distracting um, I think aspects of uh, sort of Western taxonomy. So I like to rely on indigenous taxonomy. So halahals. Um, so where are these located? Uh, this is a map that my, uh, my son produced for me um, for an upcoming publication on the archaeology of Lord Fraser. Uh, Harry and I, I did a, a chapter on rock art and the red dots show the, uh, the red paintings and uh, the little um, the black triangles show petroglyphs. Uh, in the territories. And right away you can sort of see a pattern. There's a lot more paintings than uh, petroglyphs 
and the paintings are located in a, a different sort of orientation here. They're located along, uh, paintings are throughout the Salish and Territories are located along important travel corridors. And you can see on the left there we've got uh, Indian Arm, on the center Pitt Lake, and then Harrison um, Lake and River have uh, you know, the largest concentration of rock paintings in this area. And that was the major travel corridor from the coast to the interior and uh, very well marked with uh, um, paintings. Now these paintings and petroglyphs from the work that I've been able to do, because we have this direct historical and cultural continuity, we have a lot of stories about the places that are marked. And so based on this, I've determined, or I mean, it's, it's safe to assume that all of these uh, markings identify ontologically significant places in the landscape. That's just a fancy word for um, identifying places that have uh, a very strong um, sort of significance uh, to the um, descendant communities for, um, for the stories that they, they represent. Um, here's, here's an example of um, force um, rock painting sites in uh, Indian Arm. And um, I, I put this up to just make the point that uh, place is prior in rock art. Um, you know, people have a tendency to just focus on the rock art. I call it iconocentricism. But um, when, you, when you understand that these rock formations are shwakbayam, the stories have been forgotten about these places. You know, some of these places we know the stories, like Sokeos, Siwash Rock, we know the story about that place. It's not marked, but uh, not every place is marked. But these, by virtue of the paintings that are found here, identify these places as shwakbayam as important places in the landscape. Not just the paintings, which as you can see, these large, huge sites, there's a lot of places to paint. There's only one painting in each one of these sites, or two. So, um, which is something right away um, you start to think about, okay, uh, there's not a lot of paintings here. In fact, in Indian Arm, which has about 11 documented sites like this, there's about 34 painting events that we've identified. So, you know, for a place that's been occupied for 10,000 years, you know, that's um, interesting kind of ratio there. It's not, you know, it, it sort of shows you that these paintings could be, are um, specific to a time. And uh, that's something that I've been looking at. So places prior, paintings secondary to the place. Um, so when people are painting these places, what are they doing? They're interacting, they're actually collaborating with the granite rock surfaces. Like gla granite has a lot of features. Um, it, it fractures, um, it had wa brown water flows through it, and it leaves this um, deposit everywhere. It's a, um, a mineral precipitate that's carried in groundwater, and when it flows down over the surface of the rock, it, it, it forms these huge white amorphous shapes. And this is a really good way to identify sites because this is very um, important to the selection of sites for painting. And you can see up here in the top, these are from a, a, a rock shelter on an Indian arm, soil tooth. And you can see how the artists has incorporated this um, mineral precipitate, which is also called speleothem, great word, into the painting. You know, you can see up here that uh, white stuff coming down, and there's sort of a figure there that's incorporated partly into it. Over here, there's, um, you know, the white amorphous design, and then the paint is incorporated into the design. So what this shows you, you know, a lot of people will go to these sites and they'll draw the images, and, you know, into these, create these two-dimensional images. But divorced from, this, from the geological context, they don't mean anything. I mean, you have to, the artist, the, the painter is interacting with this place. Like I said, a collaboration between the rock and the person. Um, here are a couple more examples from Slayle Tooth uh, showing, um, and, you know, I've got the, uh, the, the original photos on the left what the painting looks like today. And on the right, we see digitally enhanced uh, uh, paintings, which I uh, use a uh, image shape, uh, uh, it's, it's a, it's a plug-in. Uh, called D-Stretch, and use it with the image day application on the map. You can take any digital photograph, put it into this, um, um, this image day application, and it will digitally enhance, bring out the red ochres. Here, you know, they're not too well poorly preserved, but, uh, or, or not too badly preserved, but you can see how the image comes out a lot better. But I want you to point out how the image is um, defined by the cracks in the rock here. So people are going to these places, they're important places, they have stories with them, they could be sentient, beings, and they're interacting with this place, particularly with the cracks and, and, and surface features, intrin intrinsic to the, uh, the finished product. Here's some uh, paintings on, um, on Harrison Lake, 
you can see two images here. Uh, this is what they look like to the naked eye. And then when you use this Z-stretch application, you can um, see them a little better. But one thing we don't see too, when we do this, we don't see a, like a palimpsest of images. We don't see like, you know, hundreds of these images, giving you the census of way back in time. In Australia, they've um, done some studies on some of these sites, and they've got uh, uh, graphic stratigraphy, this is what I call it. It's going back 20,000 years. But here we don't see that. We may see two, three episodes. Here's a, an image from a site I've been working on in the Stein River Valley. It's a little outside of Coast Salish, but you, the Stein River Valley is a direct core, travel corridor to the coast. And uh, here's some paintings on the, that you would see with the naked eye. And then the D stretch you know, enhances the, um, the red ochre. You can see this is one of the few examples that you find in the, in, in the Salish world of overpainting. You see there's an earlier image there uh, overlaid with later images. Probably two, I think three episodes of superpositioning here. Extremely rare to find something like that. So that's the graphic stratigraphy, which I've been looking at in my dissertation to get a sense of the, um, the site's uh, formation process. And we also do subsurface excavation, because this gives you an idea of the practice that's going on at the place. Um, here we can see a little excavation we did down to uh, sterile soil. Um, very shallow deposit at this site. But you can see there's a hearth there, someone's built, and uh, we have a one and a half millimeter screen. If we used a quarter inch screen, we would have found nothing here. But we used the one and a half millimeter screen. We found a piece of tamarack pitch from Western Larch. We found spirally fractured um, uh, bone, probably to extract marrow. We found uh, all kinds of nice flora, like these uh, rubus and uh, prunus which have been used uh, historically to produce paint, and um, of course the marrow was used to paint. And of course we found lots of ochre up in the top, and we also found a lot of this stuff, which is um, sort of microdevitons, very small um, uh, you know, bits of leftover material from uh, making sharp implements and tools for some specific purpose. And I show this because this is a, shows a stratigraphic relationship from the, the earliest um, you know, fragments we found up to the top, you can see the incorporation of glass into the, uh, into the, the, the technical repertoire. Because glass, you know, when it was introduced, uh, indigenous people, especially in Tokatma, you know, recognized right away its value as a, as a cutting tool. They zoomy zoom. We also found this at this site. And we bracketed the site and got four radiocarbon dates. And we found, uh, um, you know, and, and this site is really interesting. It's a river terrace, so we have a really good idea that site formation dates from 1581 up to 1812. It was the, and uh, by proxy, I would give this as a, a proxy date for the creation of the 192 painting events that I've documented at this particular site. So what I'm doing in my dissertation, I'm saying, okay, what was going on during this time period when this art was produced in, in, in huge uh, amounts? Now, it's an ancient tradition. But most of the rock art we see today dates from that period in, 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 on my work. So what was going on? This is what was going on. Uh, smallpox was introduced into North America in 1511 in, um, in Florida, and then over the years slowly moved uh, west. And the people in this area, you can sort of see, you know, it's going in increments in the big sort of white area of the Pacific Northwest. 1767, 1789 is when the first documented smallpox hit. Now the interesting thing is when you, when you learn about the indigenous histories, they were um, well aware of what was going on in the rest of the world. So I'm arguing that uh, um, Salish ritualists uh, use socially or use uh, culturally prescribed uh, methods, which includes the use of this tumult, a protective um, um, substance, to intervene and mitigate the impact of this uh, holocaust that was moving in on them. And on the right, you can see the, uh, the 1789 epidemic, which went down the Snake River up to Columbia into this area and killed up to 9% of the people. So, and this happened, you know, so I've looked at a lot of areas in this place, there's a direct correlation between um, this idea of demographic collapse, demographic revitalization, and the production of rock art. These, these events are um, interconnected. And just to round up, just to, so once we, and there's evidence of this in the oral traditions. Right? And this is one of my favorite ones. Slayle too, everybody has probably heard about the, the giant sea serpent that uh, blocked the inlet. It's a very involved story. It has to do with the training of Shwa'am. And um, 
to, 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 but the, the, one of the versions of the story, this, this serpent appears right at the time of the smallpox epidemic. And there's a story about the village of Pumpkinatum being wiped out. This thing appears, a young woman trains the young boy to um, um, become a shalom and overcome this being. So this, this, this is an ancient uh, sort of template that's been adapted to the colonial time period. And what's really interesting to us is the stories where this serpent is associated um, are, are strongly associated with all the rock painting sites in uh, the Slave II territory, suggesting a connection. These people were marking these places to, to remind people of the significance of them. And it, in, in that regard, rock art is a material um, signature of uh, prior knowledge of place and time. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So I went over time, so I don't know if there's any questions. Why did you go over time? We have time for one question. Any questions out there? Oh, uh, yeah, um, that's a, a really good question. And um, the majority of uh, rock paintings in British Columbia are um, red paintings. And the black, black is very, I think I can think of five places that have black paintings. And what I've learned and what people have recorded in the past is the black paintings are associated with witchcraft and some other, some specific practice that was different than marking these places with a red paint. So, but yeah, very, very few of those black paintings. Yeah. I'm just wondering in your observations that you're saying that you've got like photos that you took with like circles and yep. um, what the rock art is. Where do you think that the connection is that you're trying to make sure that the photos are like the there might be a community publication. My dissertation, yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm very aware of the insensitivity about this issue because my Tahu, we have a lot of rock art in our territory and we attach the same significance as the people here. So I draw on that kind of knowledge, my own prior knowledge of, of this stuff in my tribe to kind of negotiate my way through this because I know it's a very sensitive topic. But I also know that these paintings were left there deliberately by you know, the ancestors. To, to, as a message, that they were all very visible along travel corridors, and they were uh, a very deliberate kind of a, a act. Yeah. And if I could add, because we're from Slayton, that when you make our maps, they use some kind of formula where you know people could take a look at that map, but I don't know what the buffer zones. I don't know what the proper. Goes all fuzzy. <laughs>
to open in my language and acknowledge Coquitlam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Douglas College for hosting this event. It's uh, good to be here. Uh, I'm feeling a little, my blood sugar is a little low. I'm getting pretty hungry for lunch, so I'll try and uh, get through this as fast as I can. Um, this is something a little different than the talks that we've had already this morning. Um, and just as a segue into it, um, a few years ago, starting my job up at SFU, you know, talking to the established faculty, they were saying, oh yeah, you know, publish, publish, publish. And I'm like, okay, okay, you know, and that takes time. And uh, also talking with my colleagues, it's like, well, when we publish a paper, how many people are really gonna read it? What is our audience? And really, if we're lucky, you know, 20 to 50 people will actually read something we write. Uh, but publishing is good. It's uh, the way we disseminate our knowledge. But one of the avenues that we haven't really fully explored in, in archaeology is, you know, educating the broader public. And so when I was contacted uh, by a lady by the name of Tracy German uh, from Sheridan College in Toronto, she proposed, well, why don't we do a TV series on Indigenous archaeology across Canada? I'm like, really? That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm game. So uh, what I'd like to do is present uh, today uh, the adventures that we've been having while filming this TV series uh, over the last couple of summers. And here's the, the first 30 second teaser. Do we have sound on the computer as well? Hopefully this will work. <clears throat> I'm a Mac user, so. Hello, oh. my name is Squamish Nation Ancestral, my name is Youngs. My English name is Dr. Rudy Byron. I've been doing archaeology here on a traditional territory for 20 years. My name is Jacob Pratt. I'm a Lakota Ojibwe. I'm from Saskatchewan. Nobody is really interested in leaving behind their history. Hi, I'm Jennifer Russo. The history that we have, that's something we're really proud of. So there's a 30 second teaser. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm from the Squamish Nation. I did my BA and MA up at SFU. Uh, I went out east to Hamilton, where I did my PhD at McMaster. And I got somehow hired at SFU back in 2009. Very lucky to have an academic job. Uh, I'm 75% time in First Nation Studies and 25% of my other time is in archaeology. And I've been doing our work here in the Coast Salish region for a long time now. And it's really interesting uh, getting a little older. Uh, I'm the one who used to do interviews and research, uh, but now it's kind of flipped, the tables have flipped around and people are uh, interviewing me. And uh, here's a little fun shot uh, from last uh, month out in southern Alberta at uh, Head Smashed In, uh, using my Darth Vader force powers to uh, make sure that the film crew is uh, doing their job and uh, got to get things moving. Uh, so I'm the main host of the show, Wild Archaeology, and I'm sort of the, the teacher, the academic, the professor. Uh, and I also have two co-hosts, younger co-hosts, and I send them on sort of archaeological uh, indigenous knowledge missions in each episode. Uh, this is a young fellow, Jacob Pratt. Uh, he's Dakota and on a shot knee descent. Uh, he's very talented. He's a good actor. He does voice acting on cartoons for kids' shows. 
Uh, he's recently bought, bought a drone and becoming a, a budding videographer. Uh, he performs traditional hoop dances, and he's a musical composer who has uh, CDs uh, out where, uh, where he plays flute, but also he's a stage composer uh, and has produced many shows. Uh, the other co-host, her name is Jennifer Brusso. She's from the Serpent River First Nation. She's an actor, singer, producer, director, writer, teacher, and activist, and has a budding interest in, in ethnobotany. Uh, here's our production team. These are the people behind the camera. Tracy German there in front of a Thunderbird pictograph in the Upper Squamish Valley. Uh, the fellow in the bright yellow shirt on the other side, that's Ian Thompson. He's one of our producers and directors. Uh, below in the checkered uh, blue and black shirt is Karen Hansen. And the other pictures show a lot of our uh, camera crew and sound people. And uh, I really want to recognize them for the hard work that they do because they never get to be in front of the camera. So why? a TV show called Wild Archaeology. Well, we as archaeologists, as scholars, have really written a lot about how to integrate indigenous views uh, in publications. Well, this show does focus on the science of archaeology, but it also presents the voices from various First Nations communities and individuals and blends those perspectives together on how we can really understand the past in a broader sense. So really, it's the voices, the cultural knowledge, and experience uh, that is by, with, and for Indigenous peoples across the country. And so uh, we explore new and different ways on how this Indigenous perspective uh, can grow in archaeology. And so I see uh, this TV series as uh, indigenous archaeology in a new form, getting it out of the books, the articles that tend to only circulate within uh, a small community. And really, uh, I mentioned before, yeah, we might be lucky that 50, maybe 100 people read uh, one of our publications, but what we're really hoping for in this TV show in the first season, if it's successful, is that we're going to be reaching probably about 100,000 people. And so think about the impact on getting the voices and opinions about Indigenous history and archaeology out to the broader public. Uh, we're hoping that it will be a big success. Here are some shots of some of the various places we've been to. Um, the, um, my home territory, uh, up in the mountains where you see the tent. Uh, we did alpine archaeology. We went to the Little John site, um, where Norm Easton is working with the White River for, uh, First Nation. Uh, we've been up to the High Arctic with uh, Max Friesen's salvage work uh, on Richardson Island. We've been out to southern Ontario to the Shibwinda site, where there is uh, evidence of lithic quarry production uh, spanning back almost 10,000 years. Uh, recently, we were out in southern Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, focusing on uh, communal hunting of the Plains people, uh, going after the buffalo, uh, and also uh, to Jennifer Brousseau's home territory, the Serpent River on Lake Huron. But uh, here's a, to tantalize you a little more, uh, here's the, the episode list, the First Nations who we've been working with in collaboration. Uh, the various lead archaeologists, uh, myself included, and the various topics that we've been exploring. So what we're trying to do is present the, the diversity and variety of cultural knowledge, landscapes, uh, and archaeology across the country. But more importantly, it's not just the, the, the head archaeologists. What, is really the strength of this show are the numerous people from the indigenous communities themselves, be they Coast Salish, be they Plains, be they uh, Ojibwe, uh, Inuit, what have you. Uh, there's a big long list of names that you can see here. And it's really the participation uh, of 
uh, these people and communities that really breathes life into these episodes. We could talk a lot about the science of archaeology and what we discover and what our potential interpretations are, but really it's the oral history, that cultural knowledge, the songs, the dances, the living culture that is still here uh, is really, really important. And it's without, if, it, if these people didn't participate and help us uh, so dramatically uh, in this show, I don't think it would be a, su a success. So uh, really, uh, these people are the stars. And so how this is all possible, uh, originally, yeah, this was Tracy German's vision. Uh, she's the executive producer. Um, and really what she wants to do with this show is like, okay, how can we present an accurate version of the Indigenous history of Canada? And so back in 2010, we filmed uh, about a 10 minute trailer that I'll show uh, shortly. And we used this as a pitch to APTN and the Canadian Media Fund and the Canada Film and Television Tax Credit uh, to bring a lot of different pools of money together totaling $1.6 million. So we could actually go across the country and have fun uh, filming this series. And so uh, this teaser, which I'll show uh, in a minute, uh, really convinced APTN to give us a broadcasting license. And that's how we were able to get all these funds together. And so even $1.6 million sounds like a lot of money. Uh, I don't have my own trailer. I, I don't have a makeup person. I have to get my own haircut. And, you know, we, we've stayed in some pretty dodgy hotels. Uh, so we, we're, we're doing this on uh, a limited budget. And if the first season is successful, uh, hopefully we'll get a second and third season. And uh, this will go to additional networks who will give us uh, even a little more money. And then I can make uh, demands for blue M&Ms. So really, uh, this is a, a visual form of indigenous archaeology uh, that I see as being really important to get indigenous cultural knowledge out to a broader public and really showcases how archaeologists have really shifted you know, into, you know, from consultation to uh, full collaboration, that whole spectrum. Uh, where the shift, particularly here in Canada, within Coast Salish territories, uh, especially as we've seen from the talks this morning, is really coming to the forefront of archaeology. And if we're not doing archaeology, archaeologies in this sense, uh, uh, you're going to get quickly left behind. Uh, this is where it's at. So uh, this is the full trailer uh, that we use to pitch to APTN. And uh, it's about uh, just under 10 minutes long. And uh, originally, uh, my cousin, uh, Het Selim, or Dustin Rivers, I, I, who's going to be here tomorrow, uh, he was going to be one of the co-hosts. Uh, but he backed out uh, because he is now helping revive various Coast Salish languages, uh, Squamish, tsleil and others, uh, working within communities uh, along those lines. So he really wanted to partake in this, uh, but um, he felt that his uh, duties should be placed on working with language. And so that's why we ended up with uh, Jacob Pratt, uh, who is not in this trailer. So you'll, that's why you'll see the difference there. So here's the uh, official webpage, uh, Pale Fox Productions, and here's the, uh, a little more information about the uh, show, but this is the fun stuff. Hello, my name is Fox Station Ancestral name is Youngs. My English name is Dr. Ruby Reimer. I've been doing archaeology here in my traditional territory for 20 years now. My name is Jacob Pratt. I'm the Kunkel of Ojibwe. I'm from Saskatchewan. Nobody is really interested in leaving behind our history. Hi. I just realized this is the uh, the first trailer again. Let's see, th this one here should be the, uh, no, that's not it either. I'll just do another search. So is it actually on TV now? This is actually on TV? 
No, uh, uh, to be honest, we're, I'm leaving Monday for Labrador. And out there, we're going to be filming the final two episodes. Uh, so after we do the initial filming, there's a lot of uh, post-production and editing. And so uh, we're hoping for the show to be airing on APTN early in the new year. Uh, we're, we, we have a, a Facebook page. We, uh, there is the website. And so when it comes close to uh, the first episode airing, uh, we're really going to do a, a media push to make sure as many people can watch as possible. <clears throat> Here's the, uh, the longer trailer. Hi there, my name is Jennifer Russo, and I am from the beautiful community of Circular First Nations of Northern Ontario. My name is Squatchalton. My English name is Dustin Rivers. My background is in cultural teaching and language. I'm here to share a little bit about what I was taught to my elders about our history and our culture and language and connection to our land. My name is Dr. Rudy Meyer. I'm an archaeologist, but I blend my investigations uh, of scientific data and information with cultural information from my home community. Dr. Rudy. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good. So what I thought we'd do today is retrace some of the path of the Transformer Brothers. We're uh, up here in Squamish, and this is how it's down here. This is the core part of our uh, Squamish territory. Hey Rudy, do you think 
think that there's any archaeological sites for some of those places that we could visit? Yeah, a number of archaeological sites right here in Mount Sound, uh, near Watts Point, others in and around Squamish, but uh, even all the way up the Squamish uh, Valley, all the way going up towards Whistler. Well, let's head out. Go check out some of these sites. We're going to need the boat. we do as indigenous archaeologists is bring oral history, place names, traditions, and incorporate, integrate those under some cultural understandings into the archaeological record that gives us a much more nuanced understanding of the ancient past. We're going to have to go up this logging road for a little way and then probably do some bushwhacking uh, off into the forest. This is exciting. Well, wait until the pavement ends. <laughs> It'll get a lot rougher. Rock is good. We're getting close just up here. You can see that little flat spot. That's one thing. Yeah, right up there. That's uh, where the rock shelter is. You guys are stuck around the back way. Or, well, it looks like we're here already. Finally got to our destination. So a lot of people ask me, how do you find sites such as this? And there are a number of factors that archaeologists have to take into consideration. Natural resources, the plants, the animals, fresh water, uh, flowing water, are all factors that would make this and other places similar to it very attractive hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. We could put all these variables together of uh, the landscape and pick areas of high potential to focus our energy and our efforts. So Rudy, as an archaeologist, where do you begin? How do you start looking for artifacts? Kind of systematically, uh, very carefully, look at the surface underneath this overhang here. And generally what we look for would be stone tools, animal bone, a fire pit, which would have charcoal and firecraft rock, but also maybe uh, soot staining on the uh, roof of the shelter here. <clears throat> hey, what do you got there? Is it something? I think so. Like oh, wow. Look at that. That's a projectile point. <laughs> good, good eye. Well, I think we should take this to the lab. <laughs> I 
thank you. Um, I sure you hope you will turn in and uh, tell everyone else, uh, your classes, your colleagues, your friends, your families, uh, to tune in. And we'll definitely make sure to get word out for the first episode and each and following episode as well. And just in closing, uh, along with the TV show, we're also going to have online web content because every time we go and film one episode, we end up with about 50 hours of footage. And really, uh, the show is only going to be 22 minutes, a half an hour episode. So each episode, really, it's, you have 22 minutes of content, and so there's a lot of editing, and we can't showcase everything that we did on each location. And really, what we hope to do with this website is to, again, have as an educational tool for people to utilize in many different ways. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank you. <laughs>